And we would like to welcome Wyatt Williams to come share information with us on the Mediterranean of War. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for uh, inviting me to the organizers. I'm a longtime CPOP uh, subscriber to the listserv. I, I tune in once in a while. I work for Oregon Department of Forestry. I'm in the Forest Health Unit, and I fly aerial survey, and I do ground surveys as well. And my specialty is uh, new invasive uh, pests, I like emerald ash borer, which maybe you've heard about. Well, I'm here to talk about another one that is now in Oregon called the Mediterranean oak borer. And it's a tiny ambrosia beetle, Xyloborus monographus is the species name, but most importantly, it vectors a plant pathogen, a Raffaella. Uh, the Raffaellas in general have lots of different vascular wilts in that genus. And so Mediterranean, it's obviously not native to North America. It's uh, it's a Mediterranean region. And it's been on all these watch lists, these pest watch lists, because it is a pest of oak in its native range, in particular the cork oak. Um, and so it has only been reported um, outside of its native range in California and now Oregon. So just so, some history. Uh, first in 2017, it was when it was first trapped. Uh, in 2018, uh, an Oregon Department of Forestry trap picked up one specimen, Chinook Landing. Um, and by 2019, uh, California's seeing lots and lots of oak mortality, a uh, valley oak. Um, and it since has spread to uh, at least four or five counties. I've kind of lost track. It's, it's spreading quickly in Central California. And we didn't pick it up in any more traps after 2018 until 2021 and in Marion County and in three more counties in 2022. We were just picking it up in traps. And so we thought ah, maybe this is just gonna be another background exotic ambrosia beetle. And there are a lot of exotic ambrosia beetles that are not pests. But this year, um, uh, Karen Ripley and Phil Chi from Forest Service uh, detected a symptomatic tree uh, just down the Columbia River here at the Sandy River Delta, and it was infested with Mediterranean oak borer. And then last week, some time, timely news for you, uh, it was detected in Wilsonville by the city of Wilsonville staff, and it is in uh, at least six large heritage trees there. How was it first detected? Well, Karen Ripley and I, we um, once we detected it, uh, ODF detected it in 2018, it was on all these watch lists. We started developing a uh, training curriculum and giving uh, trainings to foresters, in particular in Southern Oregon, because we thought the pathway might be up through Southern Oregon. So it was on ODF and US Forest Service radar beginning in 2018. Karen just happened to be driving on I-84. It's like, hey, that looks just like what we're seeing in California. And it turns out it was Mediterranean oak borer. So. Mm -hmm. so just to kind of overview, this is a map where it's at in North America. Uh, so I mentioned we had this big, very, very big surveillance program. We had hundreds of traps from basically Astoria to the Dalles. And we were looking for new exotic uh, wood or tree killing insects. And we found four different species, four new species. And one of them was this one right here at Chinook Landing. So our sites encompass both urban forestry, um, kind of like this one right here, and all the way up to like classical industrial forest land. Um, and even the pine forest out in, in the gorge here. But this is what the site looks like. That's the trap where it was caught, a Lindgren funnel trap right there in the Columbia River. And then, so we alerted ODA, who has the quarantine authority. They got some funding to do what's called a de delimitation uh, survey. So all those red dots, they trapped for three years in a row. No insects, like I said, we only caught one and then for three years, nothing. And then fast forward to uh, 2021 and then last year, uh, ODA traps, they are running another surveillance program for wood pests. And they found it in those four counties right there, the seven sites. So we're picking it up in a lot of traps, um, 21, 22. And here's the map of what it, looked like, what it looks like in California. This map's out of date. I know there's more red dots now on that map, but that purple is the initial detection in California. And again, it's killing valley oak, which we do not have here in Oregon. Uh, so what are ambrosia beetles? First of all, I mentioned that they're a little bit different than bark beetles. Um, 
and, and emerald ash borer, in fact, bark beetles and emerald ash borer feeding right in the vascular cambium. But these guys and gals, they just go right for the uh, sapwood and sometimes hardwood, and they are farming fungus that they feed to their larvae. Ambrosia beetles are pests in nurseries. So plant nurseries, uh, they, they really hate ambrosia beetles. And this is what it looks like in a young sapling. But in larger trees, um, you know you have ambrosia beetles when you have the white, fine uh, frass or dust, the sawdust. That's what ambrosia beetles uh, make. So just, I'm going to set the stage here for the next couple of slides. I wanted to show how it kills trees. And so uh, we're going to see, and I have samples too, where uh, this critter feeds. Most of the time, it's in the sapwood, in some smaller diameters um, of branches, it will get into the hardwood as well. So this is a xylem disrupting uh, complex here. Um, remember that uh, the xylem transports water, in, in particular in oak, they have these huge vessel cells and a lot of other uh, water conducting cells. So uh, we're going to be looking at slides that show the radial section and a couple transverse sections here. So we don't have much to go on in the scientific literature because it hasn't really been studied. But what we can do is look at another disease complex, and this is Japanese oak will. Um, it's a different Raphaela, but it's killing native uh, Japanese oaks in Japan. And so this has been studied for the last 10 to 20 years. So what we're looking at again is this radial, this slice right here, we're looking at a little tunnel from the beetles. And here's, here's the tunnel again. And if anything green is uh, the fungal ivy, that's fluorescing. So the fungal ivy is growing intracellularly in those xylem, in those water conducting cells in the xylem. Here's another picture. You can really see it growing in one of the, the vessels. There's a fungal ivy growing inside the cells. All of that is. And here's some of the uh, transverse sections right here with the vessels and the fungal hyphae growing in and around it. So basically, it's killing the tree by robbing the canopy of water. That's how it kills oak trees. The beetles themselves, extremely tiny. They have a very interesting biology where uh, sisters mate with brothers. And um, they can fly long distances, it appears like. But you're unlikely to ever see these adults. Just wanted to show them, unless you crack open um, an infested log here. But they have the typical life cycle of uh, similar to other beetles, where egg, larva, pupae, and adult. And a little bit different between um, its native range and introduced range. This is a common invasive species, by the way, where we see like more generations per year. So California has seen at least three generations. Um, uh, in Europe, they usually attack dead or dying trees. Uh, here, it looks like they're going after weak or vigorous trees, so they can't kill what looks like healthy trees in California. And now we're starting to see that. Oregon's law. Well. They don't fly through very, very long. So. Uh, yeah, and rosy beetles in general are some of the first uh, beetles to emerge in the spring. Yeah. Was there a question there? Yeah, I got just a little bit of a um, Do they, do the adults live more than one year? Do they overwinter as eggs or adults or pupa? I, I think they overwinter as all life stages from what I see. <laughs> and so, yeah, but they're only active, you know, well, basically they're just inactive for two months. In California, at least. This is in California. We have a lot to learn about this pest now in Oregon. So you said you can crack open the, the tree and see the adults. Are the adults kind of always present within the tree? Or yeah, they're, yeah, they're going to always be present. All life stages, I would say, are going to be present. Why, why would you expect, or why, why do we see such different behavior when they're in a new... Yeah, a lot of times it has to do with host tree defense compounds, okay. and we don't know what those are right now. We don't even know what they are with ash, with emerald ash borer. So, uh, ash, our Oregon ash is 95% susceptible. 95% of them are expected to die. Uh, there's going to be some survivors there. We don't know what the survival rate is yet for like valley oak or Oregon white oak. I, I hate to say this, you know, but this is this is news. I think this group needs to know. Yeah. So. In California, at least, it looks like it's preferring smaller branches first. And you can see where it goes all the way through sapwood into the hardwood. And you're gonna, the way you know it's mentioning, of course, you have these branching 
black trellis and galleries. And that's where they grow the fungus for their young. Uh, but that tunneling weakens the branches. And so you'll it'll look like flagging, like drought stress, like, wow, that branch is dead. And then over time, because there's so many tunnels, that's a, a weak spot. And so branches will break off there as well. So flagging will be kind of your first indication. Yeah, I'm gonna show some nice pictures of that. Yeah, yeah flagging. <laughs> Like it will be the first, and then this is what the tunnels look like in that transverse and then radial view right here. So it just looks like shotgun pattern of, of the tunnels going through there. So yeah, I made a little note right here. Galleries in Southwood and Hartwood of small branches, and then in the Southwood only the large branches. I brought some samples back there from our first Oregon white oak that was found positive, and Brantz is going to be talking about. Brantz was one of the the team members that took down that big tree and I was able to get some samples and sterilize them. So I'll thank you. you know, I'm using this teaching material now. Um, so this is one of the things you might see when you walk up to a symptomatic tree is um, the frass or the, the sawdust. It's going to be whitish because they're tunneling into that, into the wood versus bark beetles. It's going to be red because they're in the vascular cambium. So again, here, this this is some pictures from California, and I have some pictures from Oregon next to you. But again, it kind of starts at the top, and then future generations, subsequent generations kind of work their way down until uh, the whole branching system is dead, and then they'll work down, and that branching system all the way down to the main bowl, and then the whole tree will die. And so in California, they're seeing full tree mortality in three to five years from, from the time you see it in upper canopy till it progresses down. If it's in one limb, is uh -huh. it presumably on the whole tree? No. Or can you cut the limb? That I think connected? that is an option that we need to explore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so I think it's kind of like thousand cankers disease, where if you catch it early enough, you can trim out that branch, but you have to catch it really, really early. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's going to be my message going forward here until someone proves me wrong. Mm -hmm. You said in California is killing valley oaks. California has plenty of Oregon white oaks too. They do. It's uh, hitting them there. It hasn't been killing. They have not observed the killing Oregon white oaks. So I was like, okay, maybe we're okay. But I'm going to show you that we have found some dead and dying white oaks now okay. as of last week. So again, this is valley oak. You can see kind of that it's um, starting to progress from the very top on the left there. And it doesn't look like much. At first glance, you might think, ah, oh, it's just a little bit of drought stress or it's growing funny up there. You know, you might not think Mediterranean oak borer, but maybe now you will start thinking about that. So here's another one. In California, I noticed that the leaves don't really turn brown like they do for the Oregon white oak. For this valley oak, they kind of shrivel and they don't, they're not um, developing fully like the rest of the canopy. So it's kind of a shriveled leaf development. Yeah, I can really see that here. And that stem breakage, so this branch did break, and that section came from that branch right there. <clears throat> so fast forward now to 2023, May 12th. That's when, this is when Karen, when they saw that, Phil Chief came out, Rance and his team came out and removed this tree. Um, so these are some of the questions we don't know, like how fast is it going to spread? What is its mortality rate? But this is what the symptomatic trees are looking like in Oregon, where it's kind of hard to tell from this picture that there's still some green on here. And then there's uh, early leaf browning in the summer. You know, oak is one of the last uh, trees to lose its leaves in the fall. And this one is in May is already turning brown. You know, that should be a, a clue right there. That something's going on. In California, have you has it been observed in drier climates? Just in the Central Valley, yeah. So Sacramento, so kind of it's hotter and drier than here for sure. Yeah. But it's a wine growing region, and where we're seeing it in Oregon is a wine growing region, and that's one of the ideas we think how it got here mm -hmm. is in untreated oak staves oh, or wow. wine barrels. Oh, uh, we know there's there's been some molecular um, analysis done on it. We know that there's been more than one introduction based on the haplotyping here, and that the um, genetic haplotypes that we have came from the native range in Europe near wine growing areas. So mm -hmm. can it, can it be detected in barrels? Like can 
I think people are working on that right now. People outside the Oregon Department of Forestry, I think the USDA APHIS, mm -hmm. uh, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, are looking into how is this thing getting transported to Western North America. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to share, we were getting ready for your presentation. We went on Google Maps, and you, you can go back in time and mm -hmm. look. So, like, we found the tree on the highway in Troutdale, and you can kind of go back and previous years and we could kind of see when it, when it started like a couple of years ago you you start noticing like oh yeah yeah so if anyone's into nerd stuff like that, yeah. <laughs> that exercise those traps like we have the lingering funnel traps are just uh there's they're not very strong attractive they basically are simulating a silhouette of a tree and we put on some ethanol lures ethanol um mimics uh plant stress so Mm -hmm. They're not like super, it's not a super strong pheromone attractive. We're not sucking these beetles in for miles and miles around. We're just kind of throwing out a fishing net with these traps. So I'm I'm guessing that it's going to be more people like you that are going to be finding new infestations. So again, this is from last week in Wilsonville. Uh, I think this tree was like 38 inch DBH. So it's some pretty large heritage trees here. And this is what it's looking like in Wilsonville, where it has the brown canopy, and this ranch now is infested. This one may or may not be infested on the right. Hard to see the right? Yeah, right there. So these pictures kind of harder to see because of the light, but similar, where it's brown canopy on one side and green on the other. And then uh, when we went out there, just around a whole. These large trees just wet that white boring dust everywhere. Around the bottom. Around the bottom and up uh, eye level, just kind of in stuck in the moss and the cracks and crevices. Yeah, here's a picture from the base of it. So this is a tree that's not dead. It has green leaves up there, at least on a significant portion of the canopy, but it's loaded with ambrosia beetles. And so, yeah, you're, you're never probably going to see the exit hole. I mean, it's like 1.5 millimeters wide and all the crevices in the moss and everything. What you're more likely is to see is if you are able to cut into it, it's that, that the gallery, the staining. So there are some similar signs like this. We have a native ambrosia beetle. It doesn't branch a lot. And this is the most important thing. It only goes into dead wood. Period. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go into any live wood at all. So that's that's number one. And then the branching is a little bit different. But we do have a native ambrosia beetle. And then of course there's other things that cause drought stress symptoms, you know, like real drought or overwatering <laughs> in, in oak can do the same herbicide. So it kind of you gotta use your critical thinking too when you're out out there. I know this is really small, but it's in the handout I printed to you. did a literature search. Literature search and also talk to our California counterparts to see, okay, what are the confirmed hosts here? And kind of listed it by section there. So, yeah, so Valley Oak number one in California, Blue Oak second. It was one single uh, California black oak. And, and um, some of these others are from the literature or observation now here in Oregon. When it says other oh, part woods, is that just kind of? Yeah, so most ambrosia, most ambrosia beetles are extreme generalists. It's kind of unusual to have a specialized uh, ambrosia beetle, but they are in the literature. They have been known to complete their reproductive cycle in some other hardwoods, chestnuts. This one definitely seems to prefer oak, though. What were you talking about, ash? Is that a different? Yeah, we have emerald ash borer, which is another completely different critter. That is um, now in, in Washington County as well, Washington County, Oregon. So in California, Valley Oak is the primary one. Most of the mortalities in Valley Oak, there has been some mortality in Blue Oak as well. And in, in California, one, one Black Oak. It was the oak that was, uh, California Black Oak that was already heavily distressed. I think it was used as, you know, one of these oaks used as a fence post and just kind of beat up in a, in a field. So I wouldn't put too much weight on that. But now we have a few Oregon white oak in, in Oregon. 
for most of the impacted oak in Oregon in urban areas. Yeah, so we've only had two sites right now, Sandy River Delta and Wilsonville. Mm -hmm. And the Wilsonville site is like a HOA development. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to save these heritage trees in like a green space, a park. Mm -hmm. And the city of Wilsonville is like, what's going on with these? And they called us and we saw it and said, this is Mediterranean core. So you said um, there was some genetic study done. Do you know of those two Oregon sites for like the same, same genetic material yet? We don't have data yet on last week's site, oh, but yes, um, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but our trap data, we know there are different points of origin than California. Okay. In other words, we didn't get ours from California. They came in independently. Oh, so Oregon. Oh, yeah, so we've had multiple introductions on the West Coast, and I immediately raised this up, uh, this point up with APIS, which we have uh, an APIS office in Portland. I said, can you guys figure out how we're getting this and shut that, shut that thing down? Do people? I'm so ignorant about wine, but do people import wine barrels from yes. Europe? Yes. Oh, ah, so we just need to ask our local vineyards to source yeah. the wine barrels locally. Exactly. <laughs> or treat that wood. You can heat yeah. treat wood and yeah, kill the insects and bugs, but maybe that messes up the properties for the wine barrels. I'm not sure. sure. <laughs> so, again, we don't have too much in the scientific literature about Mediterranean for a period. We have a couple other Raffaellas, though, uh, worldwide. I already mentioned this Japanese oak well, different Raffaella affected by a different uh, ambrosia beetle, but it's native to Southeast Asia, and then somehow it got to the island of Japan, where it's killing uh, native Japanese oaks. And so it's 40% of the trees that get infested die. So that is a lot. I'm not going to take away from that. However, when we're looking at ash and EAB, it's over 90%. So we don't know yet for Oregon white oak, but at least for this Raffaella, in native Japanese oaks, it's 40% killer eight. Hey, why in this situation, what did they start implementing for management tactics? Yeah, uh, chipping is the number one. So once you find an infested tree to remove it and chip it and cover it in plastic to prevent adults from flying on colonizing other trees. And that's about it. Insecticides are limited and so are fungicides. They're both not showing too much promise right now. Is burning appropriate? Yeah, burning is definitely appropriate. So getting rid of the tree and the wood material is the only thing and limiting the spread. That's so, just sorry to be yeah. here, but like if we're in the field, like obviously it's difficult to burn in the field a lot of the year here. Uh, how like mobile would these be if we were like say take them a slightly different location to burn oak. Yeah, we definitely don't want to be moving them. Yeah, We have a rule of thumb at Oregon Department of Forestry, 30 miles. In uh, general, you don't want to be moving wood more than 30 yeah. miles from But you could take a travel lot or something. Yeah. Half a mile yeah. yeah. I would say the important part is to cover it because once that wood dries out, the, fung the fungus is not going to grow in that wood and the beetles will desiccate as well. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so studies in California show that they're not attacking dead wood. They're going after, it's got to be some sort of living tree, whether it's, you know, dead and dying tree, it's an injured tree already, or a healthy, vigorous tree. But they're not going after wood that's laying on the ground. So if you can cover that wood up and get it dry as fast as possible, chip it, burn it, that's what we got. But as far as any sort of preventative stuff, like injecting a tree with a systemic insecticide or fungicide, that has not been shown to work that well yet. Now, there's people working on this, but... Hey, what? Yeah. So um, our piles are covered with that black plastic. Yeah. And so I feel like that's keeping the wood from drying. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's solarization too. So if you keep it covered in black plastic, you're heating that up. And there are trials going on at UC Davis right now for this complex. See if solarization can actually kill the fungus and beetles. So I don't have results for you right now. But solarization is broadly used to do that. So yeah, it's not drying out but it's also cooking them so, and it's also a mechanical barrier because those beetles so they are emerging they are just hitting that plastic and not spreading i'm just thinking how difficult it's going to be in burn anyway but yeah so rec california recommends covering for six weeks minimum in the summer and six months over the winter so yeah again they're doing some trials right now at uc davis 
So shipping, solarization, bunch of side is that there's trials for that too. This one thing, um, equipment that you might use to cut down the tree or uh, anything like that. Hate to see that come to our side of the Cascades, yeah. yep. or uh, I, I could see it being spread by equipment. Yep. And so last week when we did have a chainsaw out there, someone mentioned that, like, hey, let's take some swabs of that chainsaw and see if we can get this stuff in pure culture. So we're starting to work with Oregon State uh, Plant Clinic, the extension plant yeah. clinic there to help us do that. Okay. But right now we're recommending sanitized tools when you're done with it. So do you know how you might sanitize something like a wood chipper? Because you know, it's going to suck if you get one wood chipper more than three nah. miles after you <laughs> chip it. Yeah, well, you might know better than me, but obviously cleaning, pressure washing, yeah. you know. Is there like a time period after you would use something like a chipper where you might say, okay, we're going to keep it here for a month? Well, UV will break down the fungal hyphae as well. So uh, that's probably going to be in the interior of the. I'd say cleaning, just like we do with boats, we clean, drain, dry. So clean your equipment, drain it, dry it. And then, uh, you know, in, in my forest health lab, we use a Clorox solution on our tools, uh, spray it on our boots. So, uh, yeah, then we're talking about uh, not moving firewood. So we're going to have a lot more messaging coming out with e EAB and now Mediterranean O4. And... This heat treatment, unfortunately, we don't have a requirement in Oregon for commercial sales. But the standard that we're promoting for best management practice is this 70 for 60, 70 degrees Celsius for 60 minutes. It will kill insects and fungi in firewood. So there are some more resources out there. I just wanted to point you to California, we're kind of leading it right now. And you can find those resources in that fact sheet. And then also, if you think you found an oak, we have a hotline uh, as a state and the state agencies like my agency or Oregon Department of Ag, Fish and Wildlife, we all subscribe to this. So you can use this for all taxa, by the way, zebra and quagga mussels, noxious weeds, and now for Mediterranean oak borer. And within 60 seconds, you can uh, make a report on your phone. You don't have to have a username, which is awesome. You don't have to sign up for another account. You can just uh, say, I want to make a report, and it can use your location off your phone. It can use uh, your camera off your phone and snap some photos, and then people like me get that every day and can check it out that way. So please use this hotline if you are in the field. And you say, I want to take some pictures of this symptomatic tree. Just keep in mind, oh, yeah, there's that Oregon invasive species hotline. So uh, I care very much about trees too. You know, I wouldn't be in this if, if I did it. And I just, I, at the last minute I threw it in this picture of my daughter. It's my daughter on the right and named her Oakley after Oak Woodland. <laughs> <laughs> Born in 2015. So I have a special place in my heart for all trees, but especially oaks. So um, I wanted to show you a couple other resources too. Brant and I were talking about how are we going to burn? So the upper stuff, the, the small diameter, branches and twigs and leaves we can ship, but we're left with these massive rounds. And um, I wanted to show you that this, maybe you know about these, but this air curtain incinerator, oh, I didn't share. So how do I go back here? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so this is very low emissions. Uh, hardly any smokes come out of that, it's just mostly heat, and it's blowing a, a curtain of air right there over this, and it's got some recirculation. This whole box drops down to the ground, and um, so the risk of fire spread is very minimal. You know, the tires aren't popping on that trailer because that, that big steel box lowered down to the ground, and they can burn through incredible amount of material with very little emissions. This is what they use in hurricane areas. Think, of, think about uh, Florida it gets ravaged by hurricanes. There's tons of cleanup needed right next to high, high density population centers. So we have a couple of these licenses in Oregon. They have to get licensed through the DEQ. Um, and the licensing is very expensive. It's like $10,000 just to up, get that application, I guess. And then there's annual things. But DEQ is in the process of streamlining this. They just did a really comprehensive emissions test, they hired a contractor um, and they, they had a week long burn and they collected all the emissions and that the results just came out last week, they're writing up this report, but the, 
The short story is they think they can make permitting a lot easier so that up there can be more contractors added to our arsenal to deal with wood waste. We started looking at this because of Emerald Ash Borer. We expect to have a lot of wood waste in the next 10 years. Right. But yeah, this is what the unit looks like, fully self-contained. It runs on diesel fuel. Yeah. Are they the same thing as like biomass um, trailers, or uh, sorry, biochar trailers? Yeah, yes. Okay, so I think there's one in Hood River. Oh, nice. Oh. Does anyone know about that? Yeah, the Soil Market Council has one, and yeah. so does... We have one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scenic area. All right, so they're right here. Yeah, <laughs> you ever need one? Yeah, there's a contractor somewhere too. They just took out an orchard the spring across the Canyon to our nursery, and they had that. It was a huge one, like semi size. Like, yeah. like, yeah. That's great to have because this is one of the smaller units, and um, this is how much material can uh, can burn an eight hour shift. Wow. It's pretty amazing. Wow. It can burn very large oh. material very fast. It just needs to be bucked up and loaded with a machine. Mm -hmm. And that's how much it can burn. Yeah. 